Hello, I'm uh, Bill Andrews. I am um, not going to be talking today about uh, clinical and case studies. Instead, I'm going to be uh, providing an education in aging and telomere biology. Uh, I never market any products. My company sometimes occasionally will discover things that we will let other companies license from us and market in exchange for royalties that will fund our research. But I never actually market or endorse products. So let me introduce who I am. I'm the president and CEO of CR Sciences, a company that's focused totally on trying to deal with the aging process. It was founded in 1999. Uh, I'm a medical researcher by trade. Uh, even though aging has always been a passion of mine, uh, I haven't always been doing research in aging. Shortly after getting my PhD in uh, 1981, I was involved in the blockbuster uh, human growth hormone. Uh, in fact, uh, you'll see that I've been involved in a lot of the biggest blockbusters in biotech in my, uh, before I started Sierra Sciences. HGH was founded and was uh, approved by clinical uh, FDA in uh, 1985. I was also one of the discoverers of tissue plasminogen activator uh, that almost every ambulance carries to uh, break up blood clots when somebody has a heart attack. That was approved in 1987. I was also involved in erythropoietin, uh, <clears throat> uh, the drug that Lance Armstrong used to cheat. Uh, in fact, I'm, I think I'm the only person in the world that's involved in uh, both the top illegal sports enhancing drugs, human growth hormone and eryth erythropoietin. But uh, erythropoietin was uh, uh, approved by the FDA in 1989. I was also involved in thrombomodulin, a drug that uh, helps prevent uh, blood clots that uh, was in clinical studies, it was withdrawn, and then it's back in clinical studies now. I was one of the inventors of beta seron, the very first drug ever for treating multiple sclerosis. That was approved in 1993. Uh, and most recently, I've been uh, the discoverer of the enzyme human telomerase. Uh, that is still in clinical studies, mostly for um, uh, its ability to treat cancer uh, by inhibiting it. Uh, but my focus is the exact opposite. I'm using enzyme telomerase to try to deal with the aging process, as I'll be discuss, uh, discussing later. My education is that mostly is that I have a PhD in molecular and population genetics, which means I understand genes and the regulation of genes very well, uh, but I also uh, understand evolution very well and uh, can understand a lot about how we evolved some of the genes that we have, and I'll be discussing that today too. I also have a bachelor's in biology and psychology, uh, uh, but more importantly, I have a minor in statistical theory, which has been extremely important in my research to understand and be able to critically evaluate uh, other studies that have been published. I've been in biotech for 38 years now. Uh, most of it's been on cancer and aging research, uh, but I've also been involved in inflammation research and heart disease research and few of the things that you saw that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, in 1997, I was awarded second place for my, uh, National Inventor of the Year in the United States for my cancer research. Uh, I'm also personally an ultramarathon runner. I believe exercise is one of the most important things we can all do to keep ourselves in shape. I, uh, some people think I overdo it a bit, but I'm more into it for the adventure and anything that can get people out to exercise, such as adventure, is I think a good thing. I've been featured in two documentaries, one called The Immortalist, which is mostly about my research, and I co-star with Dr. Aubrey de Grey, uh, and then another uh, documentary called The High, which is mostly about my running. And I've written two books on my research. One is called Curing Aging, and the other is called Telomere Lengthening. I've also was recently featured on the Doctor's TV show. I've been in a lot of documentaries and specials and et cetera, but this is the most recent one that I've been in. Uh, I recommend you can watch that. You can watch that online where I talk about a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about today. Now, one of those things that people often ask me is why I'm so obsessed with trying to cure the aging process. Uh, it's not because I have a fear of dying. I think a lot of great things are gonna happen in the future. And one of those things is uh, meeting intelligent life from other planets. And I really look forward to that. And when that happens, I want to be there. 
So that is why I'm so obsessed with the research that I'm doing. Um, and uh, uh, now let me get on to some other stuff. Actually, before I actually get into the discussion about aging and telomeres, there's one other subject that I want to discuss, and that's just the fact that you can always find support for what you, what you wish to be true. Uh, and what I'm trying to say there is that there's a lot of people that will be marketing things or proposing things and then provide scientific support for it, and you can always find it even if it, when it's not true. Uh, so uh, there's several sort of ways of getting medical information or sources of medical information. And one of the most common and mostly used is just hearsay. And but when I say hearsay, I mean the kind of stuff that the sales reps tell you when they come to visit your office, or what you hear in the news, or what you read in books, things that aren't peer reviewed or call it hearsay. And they're not always true. So I always recommend that when you ever hear anything, verify it with peer reviewed literature, which is so, so don't pay attention to hearsay. Scientific peer reviewed studies is really where it is. But, but even then, it's possible that some scientific peer reviewed studies are flawed. And you will find that when you, and I'll, I'll, I'll be actually showing examples later on. Um, and so you can't always trust what you even read in the scientific peer reviewed literature. So I, I'm crossing that out too. What you really need to do is what's called meta analysis of scientific peer reviewed studies. That is what I do all the time. I, it's a very, very time consuming thing. Uh, and uh, especially in this day of COVID-19 and the pandemic, you can find a lot of hearsay and a lot of scientific peer-reviewed studies that are flawed. And so what, to really know what's going on in not just the pandemic, but also in everything about biology and medicine, you really got to do meta-analysis of scientific peer-reviewed studies or talk to somebody else who, who's doing those. It's, it's, it's not what gets in the press it is the most important. And it seems like the, uh, the stuff that gets in the press is usually the stuff that disagrees with what everybody else says. So as I said, you can always find support for what you wish to be true. But we will never really know what is really true until somebody really proves it. Until then, it's all really just best guesses. And so today, I'm going to be mostly talking about my best guesses because uh, it's all research. And a lot of stuff that I'm going to be talking about is unproven, but I've done my meta analyses of the scientific peer reviewed studies and I've done my own research in a lot of these areas. And that's where my focus is going to be. But the things I'm going to talk about today are one, what is aging? Two, why do we age? Three, what causes aging? And what we're going to do to stop aging? And then that's not going to be all I'm going to talk about. After I get done with this, I'll be discussing some more things. So what is aging? Well, we know and we don't know. And when I say we don't know, it's because it isn't measurable. Even, even the FDA won't allow us to do clinical studies of drugs or therapies that treat aging because, as they say, aging isn't measurable. Now, there are a lot of biomarkers of aging, if the list has gotten incredibly long, it's, it's, I, I didn't want, don't want, want anybody to actually read all this list, just to show you that there's a lot of different biomarkers of aging. But the point is, is that even if somebody did come up with a way to reverse one or more of these biomarkers of aging, that doesn't mean they've reversed aging. It just means that they reversed the biomarker of aging. But let's not give up hope because even though there isn't, aging isn't measurable, we all do know what aging is. And to show that, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody here who doesn't know which photo of Betty White was taken first? Well, it's obviously the picture on the right was taken later than the picture on the left. But how do we know that? What markers are we doing? We can see there's a little more wrinkles. Her hair color is different. There's a few other changes. But to define exactly what aging is is so difficult that we've come up with hundreds of biomarkers of aging, and the FDA and others still don't consider it to be measurable. And I agree. But what we're going to do, and, and let me just say that this is what I call aging, whatever it is, whether or not it's a biomarker or not. That's what I really want to do. I, I, what I want to do is I want to see us cure aging. I want to see us turn somebody like Betty White into somebody who's 
feels, behaves, and looks like they're 25 again. And that's what I call the cure for aging. And I call this the Betty White test. And I'm not consider anything, I, I will never consider anything, any product in the market to actually really be able to cure aging until it passes the Betty White test. So in clinical studies that we'll be doing, um, we will not be actually doing the clinical studies on aging because the FDA won't allow it, but we will be doing the clinical studies on aging-related diseases, such as Alzheimer's and osteoporosis, things that are clearly related to aging. An unfortunate side effect that we expect and hope to see is that people will pass the Betty White test during this, these studies. So the next question is, why do we age? That's a very difficult question to answer. Nobody really knows the answer. All it is is a best, another best guess. But there is this paradox that exists, and it's called the evolutionary paradox of aging. Now, I, I recognize that evolution isn't the only theory there is, but I'm going to be focusing on the evolutionary theory right now because it's the most difficult one to explain when it comes to why we age. But the evolutionary paradox is, Natural selection designs organisms for optimal survival and reproductive success. It's called Darwinian fitness. So why does evolution not prevent aging in the first place? That's the major question. Well, we evolved aging about 100 million to 1 billion years ago. And before then, life was all single cellular organisms swimming in the ocean or other source, other waters and they just kept dividing and dividing without showing any signs of aging and the only reason they would ever disappear is because they exhausted their food source aging didn't really evolve until we became multicellular organisms and that especially became true when we when life became came out of the water and onto the land where the environment was changing much more rapidly. And so we evolved aging. Now, every single person that's listening to this, you all are here listening to this because you had predecessors that were successful at surviving a rapidly changing environment. And the survivability of a species in a rapidly changing environment is increased when there is more variability within the species. And I'm going to show, show you something that's going to explain that in a little more detail in a second. But variability within a species comes from shuffling genes. The more shuffling, the more variability. And the more shuffling of genes occurs when the offspring are allowed to interbreed more so than when the adults are just allowed to rebreed. And I'll explain that here in the next slide. So imagine three different organisms, uh, members of a species, <clears throat> and they have three different traits. And we'll call them genes, but they're probably at different loci in their genomes. Okay, so when these organisms reproduce asexually, which is a lot of what organisms do, there's no variability increased. A becomes A, B becomes B, C becomes C. And there's no variability. Their chances of surviving a rapidly changing environment aren't increased from reproduction. Now, the only way that, that that's not 100% true because mutation can also create variability, but this, this, the asexual species are totally dependent upon mutations in order to increase variability. Now, in sexual reproduction, we do get variability. Uh, a, B, A breeds with B, we get A, B. B, C breeds with C, we get B, C. And C, A, C breeds with C, we get A, C. And so here we get some variability, which is going to increase the chances that this species survives a rapidly changing environment. Because maybe at least some of these members of the species will be able to survive the change. Well, this variability increases even more when the offspring are allowed to interbreed. And as a result, we get something like this, ABC, a very new variability that didn't exist in the species before. So this has increased the ability of the species to survive even more. 
But that's not going to happen if the parents do anything that might interfere with the offspring from breeding. As I said, the variability is, is increased if the offspring are allowed to interbreed instead of the parents just continuing to rebreed. So there is an advantage to knocking off the old. It increases the variability within the species. And the question is, how is this done? And I can tell you right now, different species do it in different ways. There's actually no evolutionary advantage to living longer than it takes to raise your young. After that, we're just in the way. And that's what that kind of last slide just dictated. Survival of the species is increased by eliminating the old. <clears throat> it's only the young that matter in evolution. And by young, I mean, if you haven't already raised your own offspring, then you are still considered young. If you have already raised your own offspring, then you are considered old. That's the definition of young and old that I will use throughout this talk. The next question, what causes aging, isn't as difficult to answer as the other questions. Uh, not because we have an answer, <laughs> still best guesses, but because there's a lot of experiments, scientific experiments that have been done to test certain ideas. And we've kind of come up with some ideas, or the scientific community has come up with some ideas, though we don't have a final conclusion yet. <clears throat> but I think of aging as multiple caused by multiple things and they're each sticks of dynamite so we have multiple sticks of dynamite burning inside of our cells there's aging one aging two aging three probably a hundred different things causing us to age and they're all causing us to age at the same time but the real big question is which stick of dynamite has the shortest fuse and that's the one that i believe that we should be working on first now to make things even more difficult it is now very recognized that not all animals have the same shortest fuse. The, same, the, the stick of dynamite with the shortest fuse is different from humans and mice. That's why mice, in my opinion, don't make a really good model for studying aging. Mice age by an entirely different aging process than humans do. <clears throat> so we got to focus on which stick of dynamite is the shortest in humans. But there's a lot of theories on why we age. And so there's a lot of them to test. Now, some of these, and I'm showing a lot of them here, I don't believe in a lot of them, but uh, as somebody comes up with a new theory, I add it to the list, and the most recent one is antagonistic pleiotropy down at the bottom, which I will be discussing in a little bit detail later. <clears throat> but a lot of the theories on why we age think that we age like we're old trucks sitting in a field, that we're no different than old trucks sitting in a field. That is, we age because of our exposure to the sun and the wind and the rain but we're not old trucks sitting in a field. If we zoom in on a human being, we find that a human being is made up of 100 trillion cells. And these cells can divide to repair damage or anything that happens. If you get a sunburn, uh, you kill cells, but then other cells in your skin can divide to replace those cells. Old trucks don't have these cells. They, when, when they get damaged, there's nothing that can fix themselves. They, they, they require somebody to give them a fresh paint job and keep them maintained. Humans are different. So I don't believe in the theories that say that we age in the same way that old trucks sitting in a field do. <clears throat> now, one thing that we know about human cells is that we, if we grow them in a Petri dish, and this graph here shows cells growing in a Petri dish, the bottom x-axis is days in culture, and the y-axis on the left is the number of cell divisions. Well, just like bacteria and yeast, if you grow cells in a Petri dish, they will grow at a linear rate. But it was discovered in the 1960s that human cells actually don't continue growing forever. This was unheard of beforehand, <clears throat> that cells actually, will, human cells grown in a Petri dish will stop growing and they reach a phase called the Hayflick limit, discovered by Leonard Hayflick in 1961. Well, Leonard Hayflick, that's also called senescence, by the way. Leonard Hayflick took cells from a 10-year-old, and he let them grow in a petri dish, and he found that they can divide about 55 times before they reach the Hayflick limit. 
Well, when he took a cell from a 50-year-old, he found they could only divide about 35 times before they reached the Hayflick limit. And when he took cells from a 90-year-old, they could only divide 15 times before reaching the Hayflick limit. Well, what's, what's going on here? <clears throat> the, how could cells know how old they are? And in fact, that's what the problem is. They, they do know how old they are somehow. They know how many times they have divided already, and they know how many times they, can do, they still have to divide. What kind of mechanism could possibly exist inside of a cell that would let a cell know how many times it's divided and how many times it has left. When racking my brain and others did the same thing, uh, a lot of us came up with the idea that there must be something like ride tickets at an amusement park inside of our cells. That is, every time our cells divide, we lose a ride ticket. Just like every time we ride a ride in an amusement park, we lose a ride ticket. At any time, you can stop, you can count the number of tickets you have, you can see how many rides you've been on or how many cell divisions your cells have had, or you can see how many ride tickets rides you have left or how many cell divisions you have left. So is there a mechanism inside of a cell that's similar to having ride tickets at an amusement park? Well, if we zoom in on the cells of a human even further, we find that every cell is made up of a nucleus and in these nuclei are found our chromosomes. <clears throat> our chromosomes are shown in blue, and if we zoom in on one of these chromosomes, we find out that the chromosome has two arms, a top arm and a bottom arm. And inside of each of those arms is a long string of beads called DNA. It's one molecule of DNA that's a long string of beads. Typical DNA is about 100 million beads in bases in length. The beads are called bases. And if you think of the string of beads like a shoelace, and you know that shoelaces have aglets at the tips to protect the shoelaces, with the tips of these long string of beads, you can find our telomeres. Telomeres are the aglets of our chromosomes. That is, they protect our chromosomes, just like the aglets on shoelaces protect your shoelaces. And they're also made of DNA. It's just a very special sequence of DNA. So if we zoom in on one of these telomeres, we find that a telomere is about 15,000 bases in length. Remember, the chromosome is 100 million bases in length on average. A telomere is only about 15,000 bases in length. That's at least when we're first conceived. And this is where all the troubles begin. As soon as our cells divide, each and every time our cells divide, our telomeres get a little shorter. That is, it's as if they're using up ride tickets. So we zoom in, so, so the cells start to divide. There's a lot of cell divisions between a single cell embryo and a newborn baby that even by the time we were born, we've had so many cell divisions that our telomeres have already shortened down to 10,000 bases. And the problem doesn't stop there. But it, let me first say that it's okay if our telomeres are 10,000 bases. That's like cutting one third of the aglet on your shoelace off. Your shoelace is still fine. <clears throat> and so, is, so are we still fine when the telomeres are 10,000 bases. But I say the problem doesn't stop there. We have a lot more cell division to go. We have wounds to heal. We have immune functions to fight diseases and stuff that cause cell division. And we have a lot of growing up and multiple other things. So as we get older and older and we grow up, our telomeres get shorter and shorter. And when our telomeres get down to 5,000 bases, our cells lose the ability to function and we die of old age. We know this for a fact. It's not a theory anymore. But before I go into more detail, let me check that again. We <clears throat> are conceived at 15,000 bases. We are born at 10,000 bases and we die of old age at 5,000 bases. And there's very little we can do about this right now. But as I said, it's not a theory. Every lab in the world that grows human cells in a Petri dish knows that their cells are limited by the number of times they can divide. So everybody's trying to start off their experiments with the youngest cells possible. <clears throat> and they all know that this is because of telomere shortening. They can measure the telomeres. They can see that the telomeres are getting shorter, and they can actually predict how many more cell divisions they have. And as I said, there's very little we can do about this, but this is really the only clock 
of aging that we've ever discovered in humans. There are other things that you can do to measure uh, biological aging in a body, <clears throat> but there's, there's no explanation as to what's controlling that clock except for possibly the length of our telomeres, and I'll come back to that later. So the bottom line is that the ride tickets that we have, the ride tickets for an amusement park that we have inside of our cells are found at the tips of our chromosomes. And every time a cell divides, we lose one. Now, the best example of this is a disease called progeria. And this is known to be caused by the fact that these kids are born with telomeres that are already short. These kids suffer from so, all the same age-related ailments that normal old people do, but they only have a life expectancy of 20 years. If we could find a way to prevent telomere shortening or to increase telomeres length, increase the length of telomeres, this would be a cure for these kids. And believe me, even though there's only 250 kids at any one time in the world that suffer from this disease, it's a disease that we would consider a great feather in our cap to have. But it's not the only disease caused by short telomeres. Telomere shortening diseases are called telomeropathies. <clears throat> that is, diseases caused by short telomeres. And this is a list that I've compiled of diseases that have been shown in scientific peer-reviewed studies to be uh, either caused by telomere shortening or correlated with telomere shortening. And now this list has gotten so long that I don't know of a single disease that's not associated with the length of our telomeres, including the common cold. The bottom line is bad things happen when telomeres get short. It, ca it causes all kinds of age-related diseases and non-age-related diseases, but we need to figure out a way to stop these telomeres from shortening or slow them down and hopefully even reverse them. Well, now that we've been introduced to telomeres, I wanted to go a little more into detail about telomeres as one of the subjects of what causes aging. And this is because there's a tremendous number of misconceptions out there about telomere biology. Uh, everywhere I go, I hear people getting it wrong. So what I wanted to do is I want to explain what's really going on with telomere biology. And so four subjects I'm going to discuss are what causes telomeres to shorten? Why does telomere shortening cause aging? How can we measure telomere lengths? And how can we slow it down? So I want to do those four subjects. And <clears throat> so digging a little deeper, we're going to first focus on what causes telomeres to shorten. Uh, and, and I'm going to preface that with saying a lot of people talk about the uh, shredding or deg degradation of telomeres. They get degraded down. But that's not exactly how it happens. And so to explain what telomere, to explain why telomeres shorten, I want to first have you use some analogies. I'm going to use two, two analogies here. One is I want you to think of a chromosome as a top layer of bricks on a brick wall. <clears throat> so think of the beads. We've got the beads making up our DNA. In this case, we're now talking about bricks on a brick wall. So it's just the top layer. So let's uh, get rid of the other bricks and uh, let's get rid of that cat. And now we have a cell that is about to divide. And remember, when a cell divides, <clears throat> everything inside that cell, when cell divides become two daughter cells, everything inside that cell needs to be duplicated. So the two daughter cells are identical to the parent cell. And that includes the chromosome. So what's going to happen is the DNA's got to duplicate, or it's called DNA replication. It's got to replicate. Replication of DNA is the same as laying a new row of bricks on top of a brick wall. And you have something called a brick layer, uh, except in this set, inside the cell, it's called DNA polymerase. So inside the cell, we have a brick layer that's going along and laying a new row of bricks because the cell is getting ready to divide. And there's got to be two copies of the chromosome. Now, <clears throat> this brick layer is a little different than you and me because He's actually standing on top of the wall. And remember, the DNA is a very long molecule, so he's got a long way to go. Uh, and but what we want to really focus now is at the very tip of the chromosome, because this is where all the action is. 
And when the bricklayer actually finally gets the brick to the end of the roll, you're going to find out that he's got a little bit of a problem. And that is he can't put a brick in the last place he was standing because he falls off. And that's exactly what happens in our DNA. DNA polymerase, when it gets to the very end, uh, can't put it can't duplicate the very end of the DNA because it falls off. Now that's not exactly what happens. Anybody who knows about DNA primers and Okazaki fragments and uh, exa exactly how DNA replicates, <clears throat> we know it's not exactly 100%, but it's close enough and it makes the example here very clear as to why the telomeres get shorter. So there was no degradation here. Notice it was a complete lack of the ability of the cell to replicate all the way to the end. It was a complete lack of ability for the brick layer to lay, lay bricks all the way to the end of the brick wall. <clears throat> so every time a cell divides, the new DNA that's produced is a little bit shorter. So it's gonna get ready to divide again, and the brick layer is coming along, and again, he's gonna fall off when he gets there, and again, the new DNA is shorter, and it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. I call this basal level telomere shortening because there's really nothing we can do about it. It's, it's not a degradation, it's, it's totally of a lack of a function. This is the other analogy that I wanna talk about is it's telomere shortening is kinda of like a one-sided tug of war. Okay, you've got people pulling on the end of the, tug, on the end of the DNA to make it get shorter and it shortens at a particular rate, but there's nothing to keep it from shortening. So it's a one-sided tug of war. Again, I call this basal level telomere shortening. All right, I said there's nothing we can do to lengthen them or to fill in the missing brick or something like that, but there's things we can do to accelerate the shortening. If somebody wants to die quicker or get unhealthy quicker, I got great news for you. But it's, it's everything related to an unhealthy lifestyle. Everything our parents have been telling us, psychological stress, obesity, smoking, uh, <clears throat> on and on and on. Lots of different things that we've already known about cause inflammation and uh, oxidative stress that will actually accelerate our telomere shortening. And this kind of is like degradation of our chromosomes. Our, our, our telomeres are degrading mostly from the ends, but it's not the main cause of telomere shortening. I call this accelerated telomere shortening. And of course, there's a lot of things we can do that, do to, to prevent that. And that's like uh, quit smoking, lose weight, uh, psychological stress, do yoga, meditation, on and on. Now, going back to the other analogy, this is like adding more people to the side, the one-sided tug of war. So now the shortening goes faster. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's, that's why telomere shorten is because of the fact that, that we lack the ability to replicate all the way to the end of our chromosomes and inflammation and oxidative stress can accelerate that. The next question is something that I get asked quite a lot. And that is, how could the length of a telomere have anything to do with aging? I mean, it's, it's way off at the end, it's, it's all it is is a simple DNA sequence. How could it play such a major role in aging and aging related diseases and biological health. <clears throat> so to explain how it could, because nobody knows really for certain how it does, but to explain how it could possibly do this, <clears throat> we first have to go back to the 1960s. I don't know if how many of you were around in the 1960s, but this is an example of a computer that I actually learned my first computer programming on in the 1960s. <clears throat> so you can see in the foreground, there's, it looks like a paper ribbon that's maybe an inch wide that's going from left to right, and it goes through some type of reader. And it's actually on, on that paper ribbon is a sequence of events that is telling that computer what to do. <clears throat> if we focus on the paper, we see that this paper ribbon has got a little holes, a bunch of holes in it. Well, if you look, each row of holes is different. And it's those rows of holes that tell the computer what to do. Okay, so the computer reads these tapes, the ribbon runs through this computer, 
It reads the holes and it gains its information. And as students, we used to walk around with these rolls of ribbons. These were the equivalent of our flash drives today. Um, we'd carry these ribbons around, but they'd be a lot bigger than what's shown here. We'd, we'd be carrying ribbons around wound tightly that would be the size of a tree, a large tree trunk, okay, because these programs were very long and massive and a lot of work. I want you to think of computer programs <clears throat> as something that's along a string, a ribbon here, and I want you to think of DNA as the same way. So I mentioned that DNA is made up of beads called bases. And there's four different types of bases. There's A and G and C and T. <clears throat> and it's the sequence of these bases that tell the cell what to do. So inside of our cell, we have something equivalent to this computer on our left. And our DNA is the form of this ribbon. And this ribbon, the DNA, like this ribbon, will run through the computer and be read and that tells us what color eyes we have, what color hair we have. It tells us all the different traits about us. <clears throat> so now, here's this ribbon again, shown as a gray bar. It's so long, it goes a mile in the, off the computer screen to the left and a mile off the computer screen to the right. But along these, these ribbons or DNA molecules, there are elements that tell the computer what to do. Okay, one is a gene. Okay, along this DNA, there's going to be this sequence of A, G, C's, and T's that encode a gene. And that gene might tell the cell to produce a pigment to make your eyes blue. <clears throat> but in order for this computer to be able to find this gene, it also has to have a regulatory element. So the DNA is reading along, it comes to this regulatory element, and that regulatory element says the next thing you read is a gene. All right, that, this is really happening. This is actually, if you look at the bottom, you'll see this is from a, a textbook that uh, almost every person who studies cell or molecular biology uh, reads, a textbook by Bruce Alberts. This is a 1998 version, so this is not new science that I'm talking about. Okay, now, <clears throat> it turns out there's a little bit something different here about this DNA than that paper ribbon, and that's that a lot of times there'll be sequences way upstream. And I've shown this DNA partly as dotted because I'm, I'm trying to say that this is like hundreds of thousands of bases to the left of this regulatory element. There'll be another sequence called an enhancer sequence. And to that enhancer sequence will bind, will bind a protein called an activator protein. And with the activator protein, uh, then recruits a whole bunch of proteins uh, called transcription factors that make up the computer that in the next, you'll show down below, the DNA will fold over, come in contact with this regulatory element, and as a group of transcription factors, will actually activate the gene and start to read the gene as a computer program. <clears throat> and so that's how a gene works. And this is not uh, new science. This is actually out, right out of a a textbook, a college textbook for, called uh, Essential Cell Biology by Bruce Alberts. And it's the 1998 edition, and things haven't changed since then. This is old science. This is something that somebody with a background in molecular biology and gene expression would understand very easily. <clears throat> and now, to relate this to a telomere, there's no reason to imagine that telomeres aren't exactly like enhancer elements. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to exchange those enhancer elements now with the telomere sequence. I had mentioned that telomeres are made up of uh, repeated units. Uh, they're made, uh, the repeated unit is TTAGGG, TTAGGG. It's a six base repeat. That's TTAGGG repeated over and over and over again. And you can see that in the sequence just underneath the black arrow, you can see that that's repeat of that unit. Well, those repeat units are known to bind, or at least we, it's known that transcription factor like proteins called TRF1 and 2 and HRAP1, they will bind to these telomeres 
and their function isn't 100% known. They do play some roles, but there's they have all the qualities of actually being transcription factors and could actually play a role in that computer that gets involved and turns the gene on. The difference between a telomere sequence and a regular enhancer is that the telomeres get shorter. And so that's going to have a profound effect on the ability of the enhancer, the telomere sequence in this case, to actually regulate genes. And this is now, I'm using a different artist here, uh, and the telomere is now shown on the right side, but the telomere and the top section is shown as a straight line. And if the telomeres are acting like enhancers, it can actually fold over and see how the telomere is actually coming in contact with the first gene. There's three genes there, one gene one, gene two, and gene three. Gene one is green because it's turned on. It's actually being expressed, whereas two and three are shut off. <clears throat> and so the telomere will bind to, to gene one and turn it, on, and turn it off. Uh, it'll bind to gene two and turn it on shown in the third line. But when the telomeres get really short, it can't reach these genes anymore, and so it regulates the genes differently than when the telomeres are long. That's why genes have different expression patterns with age. Now we've known for uh, since the 1990s, and actually before that even, that when telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter, it affects how genes are expressed. Their genes are on, just not on, not on and off. They're also like dimmer, uh, controlled by dimmer switches. So they can be turned on a little bit or a little bit more. Or they can be completely off or they can be completely on. And telomeres seem to play a big role in regulating that uh, uh, on or offness. Um, <clears throat> now, only recently in the late 1990s and 2000s and stuff like that, did we start to learn that by doing in vitro techniques that we can only do in human cells in a petri dish, when we did these in vitro techniques, we could actually find that these expression patterns got reversed, which is actually the first indication that the length of a telomere is actually affecting um, uh, the, the genes. And therefore, when they get shorter, they get affected. It's not just a coincidence that these genes change with telomere length. It's actually caused by the telomere length. And people are always asking me, how could a telomere, something as simple as a telomere, have anything to do with aging? And this is how it could. So <clears throat> the next question that I want to get into is, uh, how are telomeres measured? And there are probably more misconceptions about this than anything else in telomere biology. And what, what you need to understand, and most of you already do, of course, is that uh, when you take blood from a patient, that blood has millions and millions of cells in it. Every cell has 23 chromosomes, and there's two copies of each chromosome, 23 types of chromosomes, and there's two, type, two copies of each chromosome, so there's actually 46 chromosomes. Then every chromosome has two telomeres, because it has two ends, so there's actually 96 different telomeres per cell. Well, the telomeres are not all the same length. Inside of a single cell, if you measure telomeres of each, uh, each telomere individually inside a cell, you're going to find their different lengths. And then if you measure the telomeres of one cell versus another cell, you're going to find even bigger differences between things. So when you take a blood sample from a patient and you have millions of cells, you are going to have gazillions of different telomere lengths. And they're not just going to be one length like a lot of people think they are. There's actually several different protocols that are used to measure telomere lengths. My favorite is the telomere restriction fragment because it comes the closest to actually seeing the sizes of the telomeres. Other protocols, uh, qPCR, fluorescence in situ hybridization, uh, flow fish, all these other procedures are techniques that are available. The most popular one is qPCR, but only because it's the cheapest one to do. And the most expensive one to do is, of course, my favorite, the telant terminal restriction fragment, TRF analysis. And that's, that's what we actually do use in my labs. This next slide shows an example of t terminal restriction fragment analysis. <clears throat> and what this is shown here on the right is an electrophoretic gel. What that means, it's like a piece of jello 
and you've put DNA on one end of the piece of jello, applied an electrical current through it, and the DNA migrates through that jello. <clears throat> the uh, smaller DNAs will migrate faster than the larger DNAs. And so after a period of time, you actually will get a smear of different sizes. And then we stain these these DNAs with radioactivity so that we can actually view them, as you can see in this picture. Uh, the very first lane is molecular weight markers. Uh, going up and down is a lane. Uh, uh, so the DNA was actually loaded at the top of that jello or gel, uh, and the current was run from top to bottom. So the DNA migrated from the top through. So the, the uh, first lane is molecular weight markers. Uh, DNAs of, of defined sizes, we know what size they are so we can see. So the very top DNA band there is the largest DNA and the bottom one is the very smallest DNA. Second lane is a DNA from a patient, from his blood. You can see it's actually a smear of all kinds of sizes. You can see the patient number two also is a smear, but their smear is lower than patient one, and patient three has a smear, and their, their, their smear is actually lower than patients two. <clears throat> now, it's really hard to say what size are these telomeres, but you can definitely, without a doubt, and this is why I like TRF analysis, you can definitely say without a doubt that patient number two has shorter telomeres than patient number one. You just can't say how much shorter very accurately. And patient three has slightly shorter telomeres than patient number two. Now, if you take uh, telomeres, uh, pa cells from various patients and do a uh, TRF analysis, and then actually try to figure out where the either the average or the uh, mode or the median uh, telomere lengths are, you can put like you can see mark it with a white dot. And then when you plot these things, you can actually see in the lower graph, you do get a fairly good straight line. The x-axis in that graph is the age of the patients, where the y-axis is the size in base pairs now, it's called. So it's uh, uh, 10,000 base pairs shown in the middle there. <clears throat> you can see that the younger you are, the longer your telomeres, and they get shorter as you age. Now, you can do this if you're skilled in the art of measuring telomere lengths and most people are not. It's a very, very difficult thing to do to be able to figure out where to put those little white dots on top of those smears. <clears throat> but if you're good at doing that, you can do it. You can get away with it. Uh, this is another example of where different people's telomeres are measured. And what we'll do in addition to just measuring the uh, uh, average or median or mode or uh, whatever, uh, we will actually, in the mead, mold, or median, we will look at the largest. What are the longest telomere lengths and what are the shortest telomere lengths? And I actually believe shortest telomere lengths is actually the best thing you could be measuring because going back to the shoelace analogy, uh, shoelaces are fine when the caps on your shoelaces get a little bit short. It doesn't become a problem until they get critically short. That's when you start having serious problems with your shoelaces. Same is true for your telomeres. The really big problems, even though we know that when telomeres get shorter and shorter, they affect gene expression, as I showed in the enhancer analogies that I showed earlier, uh, the really critical problems occur when the telomeres get critically short. So measuring the percent of telomeres that are critically short, I think is one of the most important things you can do when measuring telomeres. But the problem is that, you, again, you have to be skilled in the art and most people aren't. So this is usually when somebody who's not done this very much measures telomere lengths, they will get telomeres scattered all over the place. Again, this is age and the x-axis and, and telomere length on the y-axis. And even though it looks like somebody just took a machine gun and fired bullets into a piece of paper, um, <clears throat> their statistical analysis does show that there is a line that does show that the uh, older you are, the shorter your telomeres. It's just that you have to be really good at measuring them to get something uh, that looks really good on paper. Now, I gotta say, it's not always just the person measuring the telomeres. A lot of times, uh, a person's telomeres in their blood can change drastically because of something like an infection. You can have naive uh, immune cells or memory T cells or B cells 
that uh, are sitting there at low populations. And when you get infected, these cells start to divide and overtake, overwhelm the population. As a result, then the telomere lengths become the telomere lengths of those cells uh, that can be quite different than what the uh, average telomere length of the blood was before the infection. So again, it's, there's a lot of different problems with telomere lengths. You can't always believe it. Uh, and uh, you just have to take that into account when you measure telomere lengths. Now, this is an example of a really, uh, let's say, abused study. Uh, <clears throat> this is a study that published that overweight mothers give birth to biologically older babies. And this is, this is an example where Authors actually, in my opinion, didn't understand what they were doing very much, but they were very excited about trying to get some attention, so they made press releases about their results. And this is showing the graphs that they got. <clears throat> this is, again, uh, the, well, the, in this case, the x-axis is the uh, BMI of the mother, uh, and the y-axis is in two different graphs. One is looking at the cord blood, and the other one is looking at the placenta. And in both cases, you can see that the, this is not relative to age at all. And th in both cases, you can see that the more overweight the mother was, the shorter the telomeres were in the cord blood and placenta, and therefore the shorter the telomeres were in, the, in their newborn baby. But now, if you actually look at the real data, you see that it's all over the place. I mean, the fact that they were actually able to get a line that showed descending left to right is quite a miracle here. <clears throat> and But it would, when you think about it, it doesn't really say anything about the individual. It doesn't say that if you're fat, you're going to have a child with short telomeres. Because if you look at these dots, you're going to find out that practically half the mothers that were fat had babies with very long telomeres. It's just a very small correlation. And I think it's, it's wrong for authors to publish data like this, but it happens all the time, and it leads to a lot of the misconceptions that exist about telomere lengths. The good news is there's other ways to measure biological age besides telomere length. Uh, and those uh, very, very uh, well-published in peer-reviewed journals, uh, meta-analysis shows that they are for real. DNA methylation can be measured, and so can IgG glycosylation. Both of these show a very good correlation to biological age. Uh, I personally believe that they're actually affected by telomere length. Therefore, you know, I said earlier that telomeres are the only age of a clock of aging that's ever been discovered. Uh, DNA methylation and IgG glycosylation can be used to measure clocks, but I believe that you're actually measuring the telomere lengths. Uh, we've known for uh, many, many years, and I think I've mentioned this before, that when we lengthen telomeres in uh, cells in a petri dish, so do it in vitro, we can actually see a reversal in patterns of gene expression that would have an effect on DNA methylation and IgG glycosylation. So we don't really know what's going on here, but if you want to measure your biological age of your patients, I would actually do all three, telomere length, DNA methylation, IgG glycosylation, and stick with the old things that have tried and true, all the different tests that you can do on strength and vision and hearing and uh, eyesight and things like that that are also just as good and probably could be even better than these in measuring your patient's biological age. I would just uh, do the complete arsenal of everything you can. I do believe from looking, doing my own meta-analysis of scientific peer-reviewed literature that IgG glycosylation might be the most accurate measurement of these three, measurement of biological age. <clears throat> so now things start to get a little more exciting because now we're going to start talking about how can we actually slow down the rate of telomere shortening. Now, I, had, I did mention before that it's, it's hard to measure telomeres but uh, there have been a lot of studies done in large populations where people actually looked at populations of people over like 10 year spans or more. Uh, they had blood samples from people from uh, more than 10 years or longer before, earlier, and they measured, re-measured the telomeres now, and then they interviewed these people to find out what their diets were, what their lifestyle was, and they were able to make, see correlations between lifestyle and diet and 
uh, uh, and supplements and things like that, and uh, how fast their telomeres were shortening. Now, that said, I, I got to say it is next to impossible to show a slowing of the aging process because it isn't measurable. What do you measure when you're measuring aging? I mean, I just got finished saying you can measure telomeres, but I really can't prove that telomeres really control aging. There is really practically no way at the moment to actually measure a slowing of the aging process uh, because aging isn't measurable unless you want to do what I referred to before as the Betty White test. And then that's going to take a very, very long time. And you're probably going to need hundreds of identical twins that have been living in identical environments. And you're going to then have to put these twins in the same environments and uh, give one a treatment and one without the treatment. And then 10 years later, you can do the Betty White test to see if there's a consistent uh, trend towards one twin doing better in the Betty White test than the others. But that's, that's about the best you can do. So it is really next to impossible to measure a slowing of the aging process. But we do know from the studies that I just mentioned that reducing inflammation and oxidative stress does appear to have an effect on slowing the rate of telomere shortening. But that's been done both by in vitro studies, but also by uh, and, and also animal studies, <clears throat> you know, whether or not animals relate to humans is still in question. But in, in the studies where people were looked at, they we had blood samples from 10 years earlier and then got new blood samples from uh, just recently. And they asked these people about their lifestyles and diets and supplements and stuff like that. They were able to find correlations between things that reduced inflammation and oxidative stress actually uh, help keep telomeres long. A list of those things most notable are exercise. The more exercise you do, the longer your telomeres are. Uh, antioxidants, omega-3s, and vitamin Ds are all supplements that you can take that when people take, took these, they, their telomeres actually uh, ended up being longer 10 years later than other people in a large population study that didn't do it. Smoking actually causes accelerated telomere shortening big time. Uh, so smokers absolutely always, in every study ever looked at, had shorter telomeres than people that don't smoke. Uh, inflammatory foods, uh, obesity, stress, depression, even pessimism have been shown to actually cause telomeres to be shorter. So if it was discovered when they asked people, do you think you'll live to be 100? If they said no, their telomeres confirmed it. Uh, their pessimism actually somehow had an effect on telomeres, and I'm not even going to try to guess at how that happens. Uh, it's just that there's been two studies now showing that pessimism is correlated with telomere length. But in terms of the supplements, what you might want to recommend to your patients, uh, the, the data says that taking omega-3s, about 1.4 grams of EPA and one gram of DHA per day is probably the right thing to do to uh, decrease the rate of accelerated telomere shortening. Uh, in the case of vitamin D, five to 10,000 IUs per day to attain blood levels of 60 to 100 nanograms per mil is probably the right, a mil of blood is the right thing to do to um, <clears throat> keep your telomeres as long as possible. But we all already knew this, okay? This is already, these are the recommendations that people have already been rec uh, finding out for uh, just healthy lifestyles. Okay, and then in terms of antioxidants, it's pretty much just read what's on the label because there is such a thing as, as pro-oxidants from, pro-oxidation from taking too much uh, antioxidants. So, you, so there, you, it is kind of like a Goldilocks effect. There's too little and too much. Uh, so just do in terms of antioxidants, recommend just take what's on the bottle. So now that I've clarified a few things about telomeres, I'd like to get back to my original uh, list of Bill's best guesses. Uh, and the last thing on the list is, how are we going to stop aging? <clears throat> well, uh, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to figure out how to stop telomere shortening. And that is it's not clear from what I've already said. I'll explain a little more. But first, I want to make a few things clear. One is, Getting back to the stick of dynamite analogy, I believe that the shortest, the stick of dynamite with the shortest fuse in humans is telomere shortening. <clears throat> but I don't believe that's true in mice. 
I believe that mice age by a di very different mechanism, and so do a lot of meta-analysis of scientific peer-reviewed studies have verified that. Mice seem to age mostly by oxidative stress and mitochondria dysfunction. Humans do a little bit too, but uh, stichodynamite with the shortest fuse is telomer shortening. There's also tons of data in the scientific peer-reviewed literature that say that mouse cells and human cells behave very different when it comes to telomere biology. Uh, their reason for reaching senescence is very different uh, than humans. Uh, and so I don't believe that studying mice is going to be a good way to figure out how to solve the aging problem in humans. Now, <clears throat> I want to make it clear, though, that I believe that there's nothing else, no other theory on aging, no other method trying to control the aging process is ever going to work unless we also stop telomer shortening. Because no matter what we do, if we increase like our NAD levels or increase our growth hormone or increase our sirtuins or et cetera, et cetera, our telomeres are still going to be shortening. <clears throat> and the length of the telomeres, we know every lab in the world knows that when a telomere gets down to 5,000 bases, our cells lose the ability to function. They go into senescence and eventually we die of old age. So no matter what else we have, we do, we're going to also have to solve this telomere shortening problem. And it is possible that the sh solving the telomere shortening problem might just happen to control all the other things that people are working on, but we won't know until we try. <clears throat> so that's why my focus is on trying to figure out a way to stop the telomere shortening problem. So how did this all begin? Well, first, I'd mentioned that we have this Hayflick limit problem. Well, it turns out our reproductive cells don't, and our telomeres don't shorten in our reproductive cells. <clears throat> and by, I'm going to define reproductive cells in a few minutes as actually our primordial germ cells. Uh, but when we take our reproductive cells and grow them in culture, they never reach a Hayflick limit. That's the, the, what you often hear is human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. Those are essentially our reproductive cells or our equivalent to our primordial germ cells. Our telomeres don't shorten in those. So about 25 years ago, I started looking at those cells, trying to figure out why is it their telomeres don't shorten? Why, you know, I, I used the bricklayer model and I used the tug of war model. How, how, do, how are these things being adjusted so the telomeres don't shorten? Well, it turns out in our reproductive cells, my team, when I worked at Geron Corporation back in the mid early 1990s, we discovered human telomerase. <clears throat> and this is a cartoon showing on the left side is the green squiggly thing is the DNA, uh, the telomere part of the DNA shown as a double helix. And over on the right side is this factory looking thing, which is actually the enzyme telomerase. And what telomerase does is it adds bases to the end of the chromosome. So the chromosomes still shorten in our reproductive cells when the cells divide. It's kind of like a ticking clock. Uh, they still shorten, but then telomerase relengthens them. Again, the cells divide, the telomeres shorten, telomerase relengthens them. So it's like is a tug of war analogy, which I'll come back to. You now have a two sided tug of war. And here it is here. <clears throat> so in the case of in our reproductive cells, we have people on both sides of the tug of war. We have the shorteners on one side and the lengtheners, which is telomerase, on the other side. And as a result, they're shortening and lengthening and shortening and lengthening. The bottom line is the telomeres don't, the net result is the telomeres don't get shorter. Now let's also go back to our bricklaying model. So in our reproductive cell, uh, telomeres still shorten. I mean, the brick layer is still going to fall off when it reaches the end of the wall. But like an angel, telomerase comes in and replaces that last brick. And that's why our reproductive cells don't have telomere shortenings, because we have this angel called telomerase coming in. And I forgot to mention before, it's very, very important that our reproductive cells have this telomerase enzyme or have this angel operating inside our cells because if that missing brick wasn't replaced 
and the telomeres kept getting shorter, then our children would be born with shorter telomeres than we have because they became they they came from our dividing cells. So in order for them to be born younger than we are, our telomeres cannot shorten in our reproductive cells, and it's because of the enzyme telomerase that they don't. So the goal would be to figure out how to produce telomerase in all of our cells. And before I actually go into explaining how we're going to do that, I want to first uh, have a discussion about something else that is also misunderstood by a lot of people. <clears throat> Where is and when is telomerase active? Well, telomerase, if you do meta-analysis of the scientific peer-reviewed studies, it becomes clear that telomerase is really only active in humans in what are called our primordial germ cells. I referred to them as our reproductive cells before. <clears throat> Now, our primordial germ cells are responsible for producing our sperm and our eggs through the spermatogenesis and oogenesis process. And eventually, uh, the sperm and eggs from two different people fuse to make a new embryo. And then that embryo becomes an adult person. But again, telomerase is only active in that person's primordial germ cells and all the other cells of the body. Uh, including the stem cells, that a lot of people think stem cells produce telomerase, but if they do, it's, they produce very little. It's not enough to actually uh, keep telomeres short and, and, or slow it down significantly. Uh, it's the uh, primordial germ cells are the only cell in the body that are actually producing telomerase to the levels needed to actually have an effect on telomere sh uh, shortening. And in our primordial germ cells, the telomeres do not shorten. So, when, when we can look at some of the cells and we can find out that these cells, the, uh, uh, up to the spermatogonium and the oogonium, are actually telomerase positive, and we can also show that these cells are telomerase negative. <clears throat> and somewhere in between this process, the telomerase gene gets shut off. And so as a result, the newborn person has got uh, short uh, telomerase off in all of his cells or her cells. So the point is, is that and this is where people really, really get confused. If, if this person over here on the left has a, a defective telomerase gene, and I'm going to be referring to defective telomerase as DT later, but a defective telomerase gene there that might have an effect on telomeres in that person's primordial germ cells is actually going to result in this person having short telomeres throughout their body. That is what's really important. A lot of people don't understand. Too many people, scientists, are looking. So, so this person on the right-hand side is going to have what I referred to before as a telomeropathy or a short telomere disease. And so what two people have been doing, scientists have been doing, they've been studying these people to find out what is wrong with their telomerase gene. And what they really need to be doing is they need to be looking at their parents' telomerase gene and Practically nobody is doing that. But that's what's really important. A defective telomerase gene in the parent is going to cause a, tel a short telomeres in the child. Now, this causes certain diseases that are called diseases of anticipation. And I'm going to describe a disease of anticipation, but it has to do with defective telomerase genes. So this is a, a pet pedigree, essentially, and we have a person here uh, that has a defective telomerase. <clears throat> now, that person is asymptomatic uh, because that defective telomerase is only affecting the telomeres in their primordial germ cells. It's not affecting the telomeres in their body. So they don't have any symptoms. But because of the fact that their primordial germ cells have a defective telomerase and therefore shorter telomeres, they do pass on this defective telomerase, or the defective telomerase is passed on too, um, <clears throat> but these people end up having a telomeropathy at the age of 40, because, not because of the defective telomerase, but because they have shorter telomeres, and the shorter telomeres cause them to suffer from a telomeropathy when they, turned out, when they got to be about 40 years old. Now, the reason why this is called a disease of anticipation is because if these parents now pass on their genes, and let's say 
not, you know, it's going to be a 50-50 chance that they get the defective telomerase because they're going to pass the one chromosome to one child. Or it's going to be 50-50 as to how the chromosomes get passed on to their children. Some of the children are going to have defective telomerase genes and some aren't. But that's going to be irrelevant. They're all going to have a telomeropathy at age 15. And that's because their parents had defective telomerase in their primordial germ cells. And as a result, their telomeres are even shorter than their parents were at the top. So now they are sending, they're, they're, they're sending their uh, telomeres to their children at shorter lengths than they, than, uh, than they should have been. It gets confusing to explain. But as a result, every generation uh, will have shorter telomeres and every generation will suffer from a telomeropathy at an earlier age. Now, typically, by the time they're 15, they have not reproduced, and so this gene dies out, and uh, uh, so these typically don't be, get passed on uh, further. But these are called diseases of anticipation, where people suffer from a disease every generation at a younger age, and it's because of a defective telomerase gene causing short telomeres. Now, this is a very interesting study that just recently came out in April of this year. It was done in the Netherlands, Netherlands. And <clears throat> this is the lab that did this. I'm quite excited about these results because I think it's the first study that kind of confirms this whole idea of, of uh, disease of anticipation. But the key authors in this paper are Jan Gutters, Joanne Van de Verse, and Colleen, Colleen Van Moorzel. Uh, I've been uh, having a lot of discussions with Jovan, Joanne Van de Verth about, about the studies. But what they did in the Netherlands uh, is they looked at certain populations. We'll zoom in. <clears throat> and they found a family tree here where um, blue, there's the father, uh, squares are fathers, circles are mothers. Uh, the children are shown here. And blue means that these kids were suffering from pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, and <clears throat> the M means that they contain the telomerase mutation. Here, just abbreviate as an M instead of uh, defective telomerase. So they have a mutation that causes defective telomerase. Well, nothing, nothing important yet, but elsewhere in the Netherlands, they found another family with something similar, <clears throat> except in one case, one of the children didn't have a defective telomerase. And in another place, they found another family, again, where one of the children didn't have a defective telomerase. And then they found a fourth family <clears throat> where three out of the four kids didn't have a tel defective telomerase, and one did. OK, well, they did some more studies on this. And uh, so well, the parents that did not have pulmonary fibrosis, it's, it's unknown if they had this. Uh, so it's got to be clear that these parents all were dead before the study did. So there was, in this particular study, there was no way to confirm whether the parents contained the telomerase mutation. But what they did is they found that these, these two families were related. They actually had a common ancestor a few years back. And then they found that this other family also had, uh, they had common ancestors even a few years back before then. And then they found that this family actually had uh, a common ancestor to all of those, but even further back. And what it says is that that original people, one of the original people on the very top there had the telomerase mutation, and they passed it on to their kids. And that was 300 years ago. <clears throat> so they passed it on to their kids. That's eight generations. And as a result, since the telomerase mutation is not very severe, it caused every generation just to have a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter so that finally after eight generations, the telomeres got short enough that the people in that eighth generation actually started observing telomeropathies inherited from a gene that came 300 years before. This is a really good example of a disease of anticipation. And in the future, studies like this will be more complete because they will be able to get records from all the people in the earlier generations that passed away before the study could be, could be done. But this is the only way that these, all these families, the fact that these families have this pulmonary fibrosis 
and they had a common ancestor like that is saying that they inherited this from that common ancestor. Be too much of a coincidence otherwise. So to understand, this is something that I really want to get across to scientists and doctors. To understand an inherited disease, scientists need to look at more than just the patient's genetics. <clears throat> a patient can have ideal genes but still suffer from a disease because an ancestor, an ancestor had a genetic mutation. Such diseases are all caused by are called diseases of anticipation. So it's very important to not just look at the patient, look at the parents also. And, and no matter what the case is, lengthening telomeres should cure these diseases because they are caused by short telomeres. So getting back to how are we going to produce telomerase in all of our cells, we have to first ask the question, why don't all of our cells produce telomerase? And it turns out to be all about gene regulation. <clears throat> and this is, you've seen this before, the gray bar is part of the chromosome. The telomerase gene is shown here in blue. And as I mentioned before, uh, all genes have regulatory elements upstream of them that essentially turn the gene on and off, like a dimmer switch turns a light on and off. Now, in our reproductive cells, that reg regulatory gene is turned on, and therefore our telomerase gene is producing telomerase inside of our cells. <clears throat> Those of you that know a little bit about gene expression and molecular biology know that I've skipped a few steps here in making this demonstration, but I think you get the point. The telomerase gene is producing telomerase in our reproductive cells, and that's why our telomeres don't shorten in our reproductive cells. But in all the other cells of our body, there's a protein that binds to that regulatory element and shuts it off. That protein is called a repressor. And that's why all of the genes and all the cells in our body are not producing telomerase. And if we go back to this original thing where I talked about the evolution, remember I, I got when I got done and said that somehow we have to find a way to knock off the old, the parents, and I said how, but I didn't answer the question for humans. Well, the answer to that question is by shutting off the telomerase gene. So back uh, 100 million to a billion years ago, uh, our predecessor species, whatever, uh, shut off the telomerase gene to make it so that the parents would die off after they had raised their young. And that's why we shut off telomerase. That's at least the theory that, that I believe in. But <clears throat> why shut off telomerase? Um, I mean, it's there is controversy on this. Um, a lot of people say that we shut off telomerase as an anti-cancer mechanism. This is something called angio antagonistic pleiotropy that I mentioned before. Uh, it's saying that the reason we shut off the telomerase gene in age is to keep us from getting cancer. Okay, That theory is really popular and makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I'm going to say no here. But one of the things that these people that believe in this theory are forgetting and are ignoring is that telomere shortening does not prevent death from cancer in the young. Their telomeres are too long. The telomeres in somebody who's under 25 years old are long enough so that the cancer can cells can divide enough times to kill the person without ever having to turn on telomerase. So shutting off telomerase didn't help at all in preventing the young from dying from cancer. And remember, it's only the young that matter in evolution. And again, I'm defining young as somebody that has not finished uh, raising their young, their own young, and that's typically around 25, it could be now, but we're talking about uh, 10 million, 100 million to a billion years ago. What's really happening, in my opinion, is that shutting off telomeres is a pro-death mechanism. <clears throat> it's, I'd mentioned before that, that uh, uh, it's important for the old to die off in order to increase the variability of our genes, to shuffle our genes. So one of the way the way the humans kill off the old is telomerase, is shutting off telomerase as a pro-death mechanism. 
uh, older, as, as I said before, older members of a species decrease the survivability of the species because of the fact that they compete with the younger for shuffling genes. Humans eliminate the old by shutting off telomerase, but we now control our own evolution. I'm not going to say we've been the best at doing it. We've made lots of mistakes, but there's no reason why we need to uh, uh, confine ourselves to what evolution is doing. We're the only animals that know that we're going to die. We're the only animals on the planet that really understand all this stuff. And as a result, we are getting smart enough to actually have control over it. And that's what I feel is part of my mission, is to figure out how to prevent this aging process that we evolved because we don't need it anymore. So let's turn the telomerase gene back on. That's my mission. Now remember, all of this is still best guessing. Um, so we got to answer a few questions. Uh, one is, how are we going to prove or disprove that telomere shortening causes aging in humans? The only way we can actually do that is to lengthen telomeres in humans to see if this reverses aging. Um, <clears throat> we have to actually reverse aging to actually show that it works. And this would be equivalent to the Betty White test, as I'd mentioned before. We also have to ask the question, how are we going to prove or disprove that telomerase causes or prevents cancer in humans? And again, we're going to have to lengthen the telomeres to see if this increases or decreases cancer risks. Well, there's two ways to lengthen telomeres that we're working on. Uh, one is called telomerase gene induction. Uh, the other one, which I'll come to later, is called telomerase gene delivery. Now, in the case of telomerase gene induction, remember, I showed before that the telomerase gene is shut off in human cells because of a repressor protein. But if we were to test different natural products and pharmaceuticals to see if any of them could get inside and dislodge that repressor, that would be a way of possibly turning the telomerase gene on. So we have been testing chemicals such as this thing shown in green to see if it gets in and dislodges that repressor, thus turning the telomerase gene on. Well, we have several different departments working on this, uh, and the combined efforts lead to chemicals and natural products that get tested in our high-throughput robotic screening assay. Our robots are shown here in this bottom photo. And when we find things that actually do induce telomerase, that uh, induce the telomerase gene, these are sent back to those same departments to do more research to find uh, design better chemicals and natural products. And so it's a back and forth, and it goes back through high throughput drug screening again, uh, back and forth until we actually get stronger and stronger uh, chemicals or, or natural products. So far, we have tested over 350,000 chemicals. It's probably now up to about 500,000 different chemicals. We have found over 900 different chemicals that induce telomerase. And from looking at the chemical structures of these chemicals, we've been able to determine that they represent 39 different families of chemicals, suggesting that they work by these 39 families work by different mechanisms of action. There's probably a whole cascade of events that occur inside of a cell to actually turn the telomerase gene on. And some of these chemicals are acting at various stages in those cascades, not just dislodging the repressor, but things that are involved in producing that repressor and getting that repressor to bind to begin with are being disrupted by some of these chemicals. The most potent chemical we've found so far produces 16% of the amount of telomerase needed to stop telomere shortening. So we're not at 100% yet. 16% is not going to actually stop telomere shortening. But the research cost to do this research is about a million dollars a month. And when we do find something that's 100% or higher, we believe that's only going to cost us about a dollar per person to, to provide this uh, therapy. Unfortunately, we are not a marketing company. We would be licensing it to some other company to uh, take it through all the different steps of getting it to market. And uh, they're probably going to mark it up a bit. Uh, so it'll cost more than a dollar per person, but it'll cost us about a dollar per person to provide this. So even though this is inducing telomerase, and even though it's not enough to stop the uh, telomere shortening, it is slowing down this tug of war. So telomeres 
which slow would shorten at a slower rate. <clears throat> and that's better than nothing. But actually, it's been now shown that that the shortest telomeres actually get longer when low levels of telomeres are produced. And this is now artwork from a different artist showing the tug of war. Uh, it's been published in several papers that telomerase, low levels of telomerase, preferentially lengthen the shortest telomeres. The longer ones still get shorter, but the short ones get longer. And this could be providing some health benefits. <clears throat> but in this picture on the right, it is suggesting that as the shorteners are pulling and the telomeres are getting really short, the shorteners start falling off a cliff. And eventually there's so few shorteners pulling that the lengtheners start to win. But they only win for a short amount of time because the shorteners get added back. And so eventually you reach kind of like a, a, a stationary point at which telomeres remain at a short, uh, uh, short length. All right, so this, this could provide some health benefits to humans. Uh, we don't know for certain. Uh, most of the data that we have is anecdotal, but it is still useful to know that the uh, uh, telomerase does preferentially lengthen the shortest telomeres. Another way to possibly explain why this is, because it still baffles everybody, and this tug of war thing is really just an analogy, is it could be that the telomere is actually not sticking out straight. It could be rolled up like a ball of yarn. And when it's really long, the very tip of the telomere is buried inside that ball of yarn, and telomerase has a tough time getting to that very tip to lengthen it. But when the telomeres get really short, as shown in the bottom picture, the, is, the tip is not buried inside the ball of yarn, and so telomeres has easier access to the telomere in order to lengthen it. So we do have more research underway to find stronger telomerase inducers. We're going to continue until we find something strong enough to actually lengthen telomeres. As I said, we're at 10% now, or at 16% now. And what we really want to achieve is where we have more people pulling to lengthen telomeres and shorten. And in that case, our telomeres will lengthen and will win that tug of war. One way that is already doing that, at least in vitro, is called gene delivery. Uh, it's also known as gene therapy. <clears throat> gene therapy can be thought of as bubbles. Uh, imagine a human cell is a bubble and uh, that's a human cell, and there's another bubble uh, that we call a vehicle, and inside that vehicle is a gene. And in this case, it's called gene therapy, and in this case, the gene is the gene for human telomerase. Well, we all know that when bubbles come together, they fuse. So this gene therapy will actually fuse with the cells put the gene for telomerase inside the cell, and when the gene gets in there, it produces telomerase. And this is actually so effective that it produces lots of telomerase. <clears throat> and so the telomeres actually do get longer. And this is the method that we used years ago to do all the experiments to show that lengthening telomeres in vitro will actually um, provide health benefits to human cells, at least in a Petri dish. But the reason why this technique has not been readily available for humans is because the original ways of doing gene therapy involved integrating the DNA into the chromosome. And it would integrate at random spots, causing mutations. And these mutations would very often lead to cancer in some of the cells of the body. So in early days of using gene therapy on people, they were finding that a lot of people actually got cancer, not because of the gene that was being delivered, but the way the gene got inserted into the chromosome actually disrupted gene sequences that either uh, <clears throat> inactivated tumor suppressors or activated oncogenes that turned on uh, cancer. So this could be a way to have somebody pass the Betty White test. And what's, what's really great is that in the last uh, 10, 12 years, there has been a new gene therapy uh, developed called AAV that actually does not integrate into the chromosome and does not cause the mutations. And so this is the kind of gene therapy that we've been working on for the last 12 years here at Sierra Sciences uh, to see if we can actually uh, uh, get it actually into humans. 
the research costs for doing this research is uh, greater than $200,000 a month, a lot less though than, than our uh, uh, gene induction uh, uh, science. But the problem with this thing is it's so expensive that when we actually have the gene therapy ready to put into humans, it's gonna cost us about a million dollars to treat one person once. Maybe only once is all you need, uh, but we don't know until we actually try it because it's still a research uh, discussion. So the good news is <clears throat> that a company did decide to take this on and a company called Labella Gene Therapeutics licensed the gene therapy from us and is actually planning on getting, is getting ready to do clinical studies on people right now, even though it's gonna cost them about a million dollars to treat people. Uh, injections of the gene therapy are going to be done in various places shown up here on the right. Most, most, uh, um, most commonly would be interthecal for treating Alzheimer's, but there will also be intravenous for, for treating all other cells in the body. <clears throat> uh, so several studies have been designed so far by Labella Gene, Therape uh, gene Therapeutics. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's taken us two years. I've, I'm working with them to help. I wanna make certain that this gene therapy is done safely, even though they are now the owners of the gene therapy. Uh, the good news is that when they actually do get this completed, we will have a great proof of concept that lengthening telomeres does provide health benefits to humans, but unfortunately only the very wealthy are gonna be able to afford it. Uh, but uh, even when that happens, we will be getting royalties from Labella Gene Therapeutics to help us with our research on the small molecule approach or the gene induction approach, which will then be affordable by everybody. But we've written several clinical protocols now. They are about 140 pages each. Uh, there's one just on general aging. Then there's some, uh, some for treating Alzheimer's disease, critical limb ischemia, cardiomyopathy, uh, one that we've just written now for demyelating diseases such as multiple sclerosis, et cetera. And there's many more coming. There's a lot of telomeropathies that I've discussed before, and we can write a clinical protocol for every one of those on labella gene therapeutics. We'll start treating people as soon as they find the money to do so. Uh, these clinical studies are listed in clinicaltrials.gov if you want to follow their progress. So now the big question is, is telomerase gene therapy safe? <clears throat> and this really can't be answered yet because nobody's ever done it yet. This will be first in human trials ever, first time anybody's ever received telomerase into their cells. <clears throat> but we can break it down into several parts. One is AAV gene therapy safe to the patient. That is, without telomerase, because there's been a lot of studies now done with AAV gene therapy in clinical studies, products are even on the market. <clears throat> so I'm gonna review some of the data showing that AAV gene therapy is safe to the patient. I'm also gonna show that it's safe to everybody around the patient. People get worried all the time because gene therapies are essentially like viruses. They're artificial viruses that have been constructed in the lab <clears throat> and viruses are dangerous, not because they're viruses, but they're dangerous for what they contain. Now, since these viruses or gene therapies that were created only contain the telomerase gene, the only reason they would be harmful really is because of the, the package that it's carrying, the payload that it's carrying. Then part three, we can ask by other mechanisms besides gene therapy, is telomerase safe? So what I'm gonna do is review a, uh, a lot of papers now that have been discussing this. I'm not gonna go over them in great detail, but I'm gonna show you the papers and show you their conclusions so is AAV gene therapy safe to the patient? And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you a series of scientific peer-reviewed studies published in scientific peer-reviewed journals that have looked at the safety from all different angles and they all, say, they all conclude that it's safe. Um, this is one paper uh, that was published in 2017 uh, this is a quote from that paper. If you read the last sentence down there, it says gene therapy using recombinant AAV has been demonstrated to be safe and well tolerated in virtually every clinical setting in which it has been used. Uh, other papers end up really saying the same thing. 
Uh, it's more an efficacy issue than a safety issue is the last sentence of this one. Uh, in more than 15 years of clinical experience with AAV, there have been no observations of clinical events related to AAV integration, meaning uh, <clears throat> even though I said AAV does not integrate into the chromosome, this study is, a, is verified that that's actually the case. And AAV has never been shown to actually integrate into the chromosome to cause mutations that could lead to cancer. Uh, this is one study that actually does have some uh, uh, adverse events that occur, and all those are immunological. So people do have a tendency sometimes to develop a, what's called a cytotoxic T cell response to the gene therapy itself, not the not what's being delivered, not the gene or not the uh, gene that's being expressed necessarily, <clears throat> but they do. There have been cases where people have developed a where their T cells start attacking infected cells because those infected cells contain proteins from the AAV itself. So those have caused some problems, but so far they have been very easy to prevent and very easy to treat in the cases where they have them. Um, this is another paper that concludes that clin human clinical applications with AAV remain impeccable. So actually very good. So all, all positive, no negative results at all. Uh, paper after paper is just saying that these studies are, are showing that AAV is safe. I'm not going to go into details on all of them, uh, but you can see the papers and you should have a copy of this video in, in if you want to follow up on these further. But they're pretty much all saying the same thing, uh, is that the uh, using the AAV gene therapy to deliver other genes besides telomerase has been safe and these studies have been going on for 15 years or more. Uh, so, next question is, is it safe for everyone around the patient? I mean, we are dealing with something that is similar to a virus here. And again, there's papers that have been looked at this. Uh, there's been no transmission of, of the uh, gene therapy through blood, urine, fecal samples. Uh, uh, there's been also no studies showing any other type of uh, way of, of transmitting this virus or gene therapy to uh, other animals. Uh, they're calling them viral vectors here. Um, <clears throat> this paper, again, is saying the same thing. Uh, uh, no transmission to third party uh, and inclusion Inclusion of safety studies in previous preclinical and clinical studies indicate there is no evidence to support that recombinant AAV can be transferred even via the germline. <clears throat> Again, another paper uh, uh, says that it can't be detected in saliva, urine, nasal secretion, feces. So safe everywhere you look at it. Uh, this, this is now a product that's actually on the market now, Glybera. Uh, they've actually been testing people actually since it's been sold, uh, showing a completely safe uh, profile. So, so the gene therapy is safe. Uh, the only problems that, are, that might occur are immune responses sometimes in people. There's also a efficacy issue in terms of the fact that some people might have antibodies that are directed to the gene therapy, and in which case the gene therapy never gets a chance to do its job. But that doesn't provide a risk to the patient. It just makes it a waste of time to uh, treat somebody with the gene therapy. And that's important, especially when it costs a million dollars per patient. So the big question is, is telomerase safe? <clears throat> and there's been, uh, since telomerase has never been put into humans, uh, you can only actually do look at animal studies. Uh, and so there has been a lot of animal studies looking at safety of telomerase in mice, human telomerase in mice in a lot of cases. <clears throat> and, and, and they've actually, in some cases, seen uh, uh, extension of life in mice. But in this particular study, the important thing is that they sh saw no incidence of spontaneous malignancies. Well, there's mice get uh, cancers all the time, but in this particular study, they showed that the mice treated with the gene therapy did not have an increased incidence of the spontaneous malignancies over the controls that weren't treated. Um, <clears throat> this is actually another study that showed that uh, there was no uh, chromosome instability uh, that would, uh, chromosome instabilities are what typically cause uh, cancers. Uh, uh, these mice uh, were perfectly healthy. They actually 
uh, live longer. Uh, so they actually, they became healthier as a result of the telomerase gene therapy being, de being delivered to them. Um, the, uh, there's other studies that have been done that instead of actually uh, in using a gene therapy, they, they, inter they, they provided mice with telomerase by uh, um, crossbreeding. Uh, again, there was an uh, absence of increased cancer in some of these studies. Um, and uh, again, another study says they see an increase longevity without increasing cancer. Um, uh, more on, on that. Just study after study, there's, there's, every study has shown that there is no uh, uh, risk to the animal by being treated with a telomerase gene therapy. And there is the whole question about cancer, which I'm going to be coming back to shortly, because there is a rumor that telomerase causes cancer, which I will uh, uh, dispel shortly. So right now, does telomerase cause cancer? That's a big question that a lot of people are asking because there's a lot of rumors going around to that effect that telomerase causes cancer. One of the main reasons why this rumor has even begun is because back in the early days when we first discovered telomerase, while well, I was still working at Geron Corporation, one of the first things we did was put the antisense of telomerase into uh, cancer cells and showed that it essentially killed every cancer by essentially causing the cancers to die of accelerated aging. Um, a lot of people concluded that from that by inhibiting telomerase. If that killed the cancer, then telomerase must be the cause of the cancer. But that couldn't be further from the truth. There's absolutely no clinical data whatsoever, not even in vitro data whatsoever, saying that telomerase causes cancer. People, a lot of people like to believe that there's been a lot of studies where people put telomerase even into human cells in a Petri dish and they became cancer. There's not a single data published anywhere, even unpublished, where that has been shown to be true. <clears throat> no studies have been done to show that putting telomerase into a cell, into a human cell, increases the chances of that becoming cancer. And as I will show you in a few minutes, it actually decreases the risk of it becoming cancer. Every effort to try to get cancer has failed. <clears throat> Results of the thing is that for every study that suggests that telomerase might cause cancer, and these are papers where the data doesn't say it at all. They just suggest it either in the discussion or the introduction part of their paper that it might cause cancer. But for every one of these papers, there's at least 10 studies that show that it's the lack of telomerase that causes cancer. Yes, lack of telomerase does cause cancer. We know that. We already get cancer in our, in our human, humans already get cancers all the time. And it's as I'm going to show, it's partially because of the lack of telomerase. So why does the lack of telomerase cause cancer? Uh, and it's because lack of telomerase causes telomeres to get short, and it's been shown in numerous scientific peer-reviewed studies that short telomeres actually cause the rate of mutations to skyrocket inside cells with short telomeres. It also causes chromotherpes, which is just another form of mutations, except in this case, the mutations are so large, they're called chromosome rearrangements, and they're visible in the microscope. <clears throat> so short telomeres actually wreak a lot of havoc on the DNA, causing all kinds of mutations and rearrangements. These mutations and rearrangements cause cancer. All cancers are caused by mutations, where genes are uh, reshuffled with other genes, uh, to actually turn on oncogenes or, or turn, on, to, turn off tumor suppressors, and, and the mutations cause cancers. But <clears throat> the mutations also cause telomeres to not shorten. Somehow during all this, so after a cell becomes cancer, the cancer be can become immortal by causing more mutations and rearrangements that actually will turn on the telomerase gene, not by the normal mechanisms, but by some chromosome rearrangement or some of the like. It also can uh, cause telomeres to not shorten by a, pr a protocol called ALT, ALT, which stands for Alternative Lengthening of Telomeres. It's, uh, in most cases, it's related to re uh, 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 increased rate of recombination at telomeres, which allows telomeres to get longer. So either way, 
somehow these mutations are not only causing cancer, but they're also causing these cancers to become immortal by, via telomerase or ALT. It also causes the mutations that allow the cancer to metastasize. So uh, short telomeres cause mutations that, cause, that increase the risk of metastasis. And most importantly, it's the reason why most people treated with uh, chemotherapies f usually see that the cancer comes back because uh, the short telomeres increase the mutation rate, which just allows cancers to survive whatever you hit them with. So telomerase does not increase the risk of cancer. It actually decreases it. <clears throat> and there's been lots of publication support. And as I mentioned earlier, there's not a single publication that shows that telomerase increases the risk of cancer, even though a lot of people have done studies to try to show that. Now, I could spend hours on this subject. Uh, I would like to refer you instead to read pages 64 to 77 in my book called Telomere Lengthening, where I talk about this a lot, show a lot of data, uh, discussions about why telomerase does not cause cancer. But where, where I've done a really thorough job of that is in a presentation I gave in Tokyo in 2017. <clears throat> and that presentation is on our website at www.sierrasci.com. And it's a, a long presentation. I recommend you begin watching it 25 minutes and 25 seconds so you can hear my discussion of why telomerase does not cause cancer. And I, in this particular thing, I go into excruciating detail, talking about all the rumors and the papers that, that possibly hint at the fact and what's wrong with them. And also I talk about the people that are spreading the rumors that telomerase causes cancer and show why they're wrong. So I recommend looking at that. So getting back to the labella gene therapeutics uh, clinical studies, the question needs to be asked, when is the risk from no treatment greater than the risk from a treatment? Because there's always a risk in first in human clinical studies, but in the case of where people are suffering from advanced telomeropathies, where their life expectancy is very short, such a treatment provides them with their possible only hope of surviving and possibly a side effect would be actually a very big improvement in their health. So when is the risk for no treatment greater than the risk from treatment? And we'll be, get back to that in a second. But the most serious risk to the patient could be not treating the patient at all. And that's something that's really important when you consider the fact that these are first in human studies and uh, uh, they come with risks. But Alzheimer's, for example, everybody who has Alzheimer's dies from their Alzheimer's unless they die from something else first. And, and at the most, they, they survive 10 years at the most after being diagnosed. Typically, five years is what the average survival rate after being diagnosed with Alzheimer's is. But even old age is a high risk of dying. Okay, given, like, if you are 89 years old, and probably a lot of people listening to this video are 89 years old, even if you're healthy, you have only 11% chance, you have an 11% chance of dying by 90. That is, you only have a 89% uh, chance of making it to 90. That's high risk. So, so if you are suffering from uh, advanced age, uh, participating in a clinical study might be something you might wanna choose to do, just because the risk of not being treated might be greater than the risk of being treated. So <clears throat> there have been actually 200 plus clinical studies delivering other genes so far. There's been no serious issues except for immune sensitivity. As I mentioned before, there were some people that developed cytotoxic T cell responses. But Labella and I have gone through, studied, uh, reviewed all these studies uh, reviewed papers that have come up with solutions for all these things, and we have taken everything into account to prevent these. So these problems have been solved as much as they can be uh, in the studies, and we, it is very unlikely that we're going to see anybody having any immune sensitivity problems. And this is the actual only adverse effect or adverse event that is expected with uh, telomerase gene therapy. There are other problems 
but they're not considered adverse events. Other problems include the fact that some people already have what are called neutralizing substances. Sometimes these are antibodies, sometimes they're not antibodies, but neutralizing substances in their blood that actually destroys the gene therapy as soon as it's injected into the blood. Well, that's not an adverse event for the patient. It sure is an adverse event for labella gene therapeutics, especially when this costs a million dollars. But we have also reviewing the literature and talking to reading other studies have figured out ways of preventing this too. Another problem is that DNA itself can be immunogenic. Uh, and again, we have figured that out from looking at other studies and reviewing papers on how to make DNA non-immunogenic. And one of the big problems that occurred, especially in the early days, is that after you get treated, you do develop an immune response and a subsequent treatment can't be done. But again, science has come a long way since the first AAV studies. That's been solved and everything that we know about solving that has been included in the Bella clinical studies. So why do I believe that telomerase gene therapy might actually work? Well, this is based on a lot of previous studies with uh, other gene therapies that existed before AAV. And these gene therapy studies were done on human cells or tissues or uh, uh, animal studies. The first one that I want to show is from 1998, shortly after we had discovered the telomerase gene. Um, we, we actually were able to show that when we put it into human cells, we could actually extend them beyond the Hayflick limit. And this is definitely became the definition of, of being immortal, at least in a human cell in a Petri dish. That is, remember I showed you before uh, a graph showing that when you take human cells and grow it in a Petri dish, uh, x-axis is days in culture, y-axis is number of cell divisions. They actually grow at a linear rate, but then they level off at the Hayflick limit. Well, we found in that study that I just showed you uh, that when we actually treated these cells first with the telomerase gene therapy, they actually abolished the Hayflick limit. They actually kept continuing growing and growing and growing, and they became, by definition, immortal. Now, there was also studies done after I left Euron Corporation by uh, my colleague Walter Funk, where he actually took human skin and grew it on the back of a mouse. And so he would have a mouse with human skin growing on the back of it. And he'd have some mice with old human skin and some mouse, mice with young human skin. Then in some cases, he treated that skin with the telomerase gene therapy. And in other cases, uh, he didn't. Well, what he found was that uh, human skin visibly looked young when it was treated with telomerase. And the human skin behaved young in every way imaginable. And in fact, looking at 30 different biomarkers of aging, he found that they were all reversed in the human skin when treated with um, the telomerase gene therapy. And it's not just they stopped, they were actually reversed in every way imaginable. And then lastly, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Ron DePinnell at Harvard actually took a telomerase gene therapy and treated engineered mice. I had mentioned before that not all animals age by telomere shortening. Mice uh, age more by oxidative stress and uh, mitochondria dysfunction. But he was able to engineer mice by uh, giving them short telomeres and turning it off and making it so they don't produce telomerase. So they started, they, they did age like humans. And in this case, when he reintroduced telomerase by uh, providing them with a drug called 4-hydroxytamoxifen, which controlled the promoter that expressed telomerase in his gene therapy, he actually saw age reversal. And so the publications, the press releases that came out is telomerase reverses the aging process. And what they saw in the studies that they saw a 33% increase in telomere lengths. They saw a restoration of fertility, restoration of spleen size, restoration of sense of smell a restoration of brain size and function, and a threefold increase in survival after 25 weeks. So they saw a lot of very positive, no negative things. Dr. Rhonda Pinnell was actually a cancer researcher. I think he was expecting to see all these mice get cancer, and the exact opposite happened. 
But this is, this he, Dr. Rhonda Pennell was interviewed by Diane Sawyer, and I'm just going to show a clip from that interview uh, shortly after this study was done. And now, now eternal, eternal youth. youth. Is it in a cage around the corner? News tonight of a breakthrough for some pioneering mice. But we always wonder, what does a fountain of youth for rodents reveal for humans? Here's Sharon Alfonsi reporting. I feel tremendous. In the movie Cocoon, it's a swimming pool that turns back the clock for a group of senior citizens. But now, researchers have found a way not just to stop, but reverse the aging process. The key is something called a telomere. We all have them. They're the tips or caps of your chromosome, seen here in yellow. This is what it looks like in a young adult. But as you grow older, the telomeres become damaged and frayed. And as they stop working, we start aging, experiencing things like hearing and memory loss. Scientists took mice who were prematurely aged, added an enzyme, and essentially turned their telomeres back on. You can see it before the enzyme, after. Their brain function improved, their fertility was restored. It was a, a remarkable uh, reversal of the aging process. Look at this picture. The mouse on the right has bad skin, gray hair, and is balding. But the one on the left had its telomeres flipped back on. And you could see that uh, essentially you now have a dark coat color, uh, that the hair uh, is restored, that the coat uh, has a nice healthy sheen to it. Even more dramatic, the change in brain size. This is before the mice had 75% of a normal brain, like a patient with severe Alzheimer's. But after the telomeres were reactivated, the brain returns to normal size. As for humans, while it is just one factor, scientists now say by looking at our blood cells and measuring those telomeres, you can get a better idea of how well you'll age. The longer the telomere, the better the chances for a more graceful aging. But as for tinkering with them and turning back our aging process, researchers say we still have a long way to go. Sharon Alfonsi, ABC News, New York. There's other reasons why I think that uh, introducing telomerase to humans might provide them with health benefits. And that begins with the fact that there are animals that have been discovered on this planet that show no detectable aging whatsoever. And the first of which was lobsters. Uh, <clears throat> people have been, you know, really didn't really care about how long animals lived until Darwin actually published his work. And then people started doing things like collecting animals, keeping them in cages and uh, uh, aquariums. They had to acquire them when they were first born, otherwise they didn't know how old they were. But they started watching to see how old they uh, get, and they, they observed that lobsters never seemed to age. Um, 150 years later, lobsters were still fine. Uh, it was published that uh, the reason for this uh, increased longevity is because they have telomerase produced in all their cells, and their telomeres never get shorter. And likewise, other studies show that lobsters rarely get cancer and other diseases too. So it, it was suggesting that, that uh, the telomerase in lobsters was actually giving them their increased longevity and also keeping them healthy, especially from getting cancer. Turned out there were other animals that were observed to be the same way that include clams and tortoises, uh, humpback whales and some fish. Uh, Charles Darwin actually had a pet tortoise named Harriet, and she just died recently at 180 years old. Uh, there's a humpback whale that was found to be 130 years old. Uh, but none of these animals actually had like rings on a tree that you could count to actually figure out how old they were. And the exception was clams. If you look closely at these clams, you can see that they have stripes on them. Well, it turns out they get a new stripe every year. So you can you can tell how old a clam is by just counting the number of stripes on their shells. And lo and behold, by doing that, they found uh, clams that were over 150, uh, over 500 years old. So, so all these animals that I just discussed, they all have telomerase produced in all their cells. They have no telomere shorting. Uh, and they rarely ever get cancer and other diseases. So this sounds like telomerase could be a really real benefit, and I'm looking forward to actually seeing the benefits that it provides to humans. So <clears throat> getting back to the gene therapy again, this gene therapy that we're using actually in vitro provides more than 30 times the amount of telomerase needed to stop telomere shortening. Uh, that might sound like excessive, but 
there really is no studies that actually uh, show convincingly that having long telomeres is a problem. There's a few studies suggesting that long telomeres might give negative consequences, but that analysis of those studies really rule those out. Um, <clears throat> but what has been done here, and I just went over all this data, providing uh, telomerase by gene therapy to uh, animals has er, and human cells has reversed aging in human cells in vitro. It has reversed aging in human skin grown on the back of a mouse, and it has reversed aging in engineered mice by every biomarker we could imagine looking at. And this is the only thing, the only theory on aging that has ever been able to do any one of these things. So this is another reason why I strongly believe there's a really good chance that this telomerase gene therapy that Labella Gene Therapeutics is going to do might give us some very exciting results. So why is it taking so long? I licensed it to Labella Gene Therapeutics in 2017, and they still haven't treated their first patient. Well, funding's the issue. They have to find the funding. We have to find the funding. Funding's been a major obstacle in trying to do any biotech research in uh, aging for a lot of people, not just Sierra Sciences. The two approaches that we're doing are gene induction research and gene therapy research. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the research cost for the gene induction is greater than $1 million per month. Uh, the cost to do the gene therapy research is about a little over $200,000 a month. The treatment cost, if we succeed in finding something that will lengthen telomeres, is uh, less than a dollar per patient, but it will be more than a million dollars per patient with the gene therapy. But that provides us with proof of concept, and that's really important because when we have that proof of concept, providing being able to come up with this drug would be a lot easier because we'll have funding. With the appropriate funding, we think that we could have a pill using this gene induction research that cures aging, actually lengthens telomeres, and actually might give uh, somebody let somebody pass the Betty White test in one to three years from now. That is, we'll have a pill ready for testing. It'll probably take another 10 years for the testing to get done, but during that testing, we'll probably see some people, I hope, pass the Betty White test. So when will it be available for you to prescribe? Well, this is a dilemma too. Okay, well, first, this is what we do. My company does discovery. We discover treatments and therapies for diseases, and, most, and almost everything we do is related to uh, aging. But after, after we discover it, it's got to be tested, and we are not a testing lab. We need to find a partner to actually do the testing. Uh, first, the preclinical animal testing, uh, or the animal testing in case we're, we discover a product for animals, and then, then the clinical studies have to be done too. And we need to be partnering with some company to be able to do this. Uh, that company needs to obtain regulatory approval. But that also might require bringing in another company that actually special, specializes in getting regulatory approval. <clears throat> then somebody has to manufacture the product, whether that's one of the previous companies or a new company. That still has to happen. Then the product needs to be marketed by a marketing company. And then doctors like yourselves can prescribe this to your patients. So <clears throat> this is what we do. This is what you do. There's a lot in between that. And it's been a real struggle, unbelievable struggle, to try to make these things actually go through. And I frankly do not understand why it is so much trouble. When I first started this company, I thought, uh, as soon as we have things that actually start inducing telomerase, we wouldn't have any problems finding somebody else to carry the baton to get the rest of these things done. We aren't doing these ourselves because we want to continue. We want to focus on continuing our uh, discovery uh, research, and we also don't have the funding to do it. So, I would like, in closing, I'd like to. Uh, recommend some reading. Uh, of course, there's my two books, Telomere Lengthening and Curing Aging. But I also highly recommend a very good book on aging written by Dr. Sandra Kaufman called The Kaufman Protocol. I think it's the best book ever written on things that your patients could be doing now to uh, slow down the aging process and stay healthy as much as possible. Uh, 
in cancer, I highly recommend these two books, uh, The First Cell by Azar Raza, and also The Immunotherapy Revolution by Dr. Jason Williams. When it comes to heart disease, I recommend uh, this book uh, by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. I would say that's also the best book I've ever read on the subject of reducing inflammation, not just for heart disease, but for everything. But another book I think is really great is this book by Drs. Bradley Bale and Amy Donine called Beat the Heart Attack Gene. I highly recommend reading those books. I think there's a lot for anybody to, to learn from those. Bottom line, I'm on a mission to cure aging. And I hope to see you there. Thank you very much.